keep in mind. So first, everyone will be on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the question box at any time throughout the session. We will be saving all of the questions until the end. You can also download a PDF of the presentation by clicking the handout section on your control panel, as well as many other resources that are gonna be re relevant to today's talk. We also send a follow-up email that includes a link to all the materials covered today and any other information you may need. Uh, this training has not been pre-approved for any type of CEU or training credit hours. We do send a certificate as a courtesy to attendees that register and attend the entire webinar. Your certificate will be emailed to you automatically within 30 days of the training date. Again, we can't guarantee that this training will meet specific state or professional licensing renewal requirements. If you have any questions about this or you need assistance, please contact smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about us. <clears throat> the Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all US states and territories to help local water systems achieve their goals and stay in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And here you can see the various centers that make up the Environmental Finance Center Network. We work together to create solutions to difficult how to pay issues of environmental protection and improvement. And on that note, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Eva Olsaker, who will be kicking things off today. Eva is a senior manager at the Government Finance Officers Association, and I'm super pleased to be having her on our webinar today. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Tess. Um, I just wanted to provide just a quick introduction. Again, I'm, I'm Eva Olsaker with GFOA. Uh, and we just wanted to provide some basic kind of general information about GFOA, who we are as an, as an organization. If you're not, um, you know, familiar with the Government Finance Officers Association, as uh, Tess had mentioned, we've been in partnership with uh, EFCN for, for quite some time, initially um, kind of taking a role as from a, a marketing and outreach uh, effort, but we're really excited today uh, to have a joint webinar with uh, one of our board members, Margaret Mogia, who's gonna provide a, a nice case study. Um, but for those of you that aren't familiar, the Government Finance Officers Association is uh, a membership not-for-profit association that, we, that was started uh, over a century ago in 1906. Um, we have offices, uh, our primary office is in Chicago, and we have an office uh, in DC. And our, our mission is to promote best practice in public finance. And so we work tirelessly to provide um, best practices around government finance for local government, uh, around accounting, auditing, budgeting, uh, capital planning, uh, debt, financial reporting, and essentially everything that uh, re revolves around government finance. Um, so our core mission is to promote best practice with, um, for public sector organizations. Uh, we have technical resources, so for those of you that work in accounting or the finance office, if you have a blue book on your shelf, uh, that's a GFOA-provided resource. And so, um, you know, definitely take advantage of the blue book. Um, we also provide uh, consulting services, so I'm in the Research and Consulting Center. And uh, what we do is we um, do a variety of things, but we do a lot of research on uh, financial policies, uh, transparency, uh, financial resiliency, and I happen to be involved with working with local governments on process improvement initiatives, often working with governments um, in advance of their implementation of a financial management system or an ERP system. So essentially a lot of us in the, on the consulting side uh, help organizations improve business process. Uh, we have, a, as I mentioned, we have an office in D.C., and so we have a, a small staff there that's really an advocate for small government that works on behalf of basically all of us. Um, the big thing is, is that at GFOA, um, we pride ourselves in being a resource for local government, uh, an educator, a facilitator, and an advocate for uh, over 21,000 members that uh, in the United States and Canada. Um, just as a general kind of FYI, a lot of our members are cities and counties, but of course we have a lot of special districts. Um, and of course, utilities on the electric side, but obviously then also today on the water utility side. Um, just from GFOA's perspective, we provide a, a variety of resources from, we offer a, a, a bi-monthly magazine, the Government Finance Review. 
a variety of books and materials, uh, training opportunities. Now, of course, everything is essentially webinar, but we have in-house training on budgeting, accounting, uh, ERP uh, implementation um, opportunities. Um, and so you can uh, advance to the next slide. But the, the main thing is, is that we're a resource indicator for um, uh, go local governments in the finance field. Uh, as I had mentioned, our, our focus uh, is to promote best practice and uh, advisories. And that essentially comes about by a variety of committees that are um, staffed by uh, local governments. And they essentially volunteer their time and their mission at Margaret's Banana Committee is to uh, basically work on behalf of local governments to try and improve government and offer and advise, um, you know, promote best practices. Um, so that's really a kind of a core kind of value that GFOA provides our members and also non-members. I welcome you and kind of encourage you to go to GFOA's website at gfoa.org. There's a tremendous amount of free material and content, content uh, on our website, uh, research papers, um, that, uh, these best practices that we're talking about and uh, the, the best practices that are related to asset management have been posted as a handout. So by all means, make sure you download those. Um, also on our website, there's uh, financial policies, articles from our government finance review. Um, even today on our webpage are things regarding uh, school budgeting. Um, so uh, anyway, please take advantage, take a look at our website. If you're interested in membership, there's of course a membership page. Um, it's very affordable. Uh, I think it's $160 to be a member, but the idea is that once you're a member, you can get kind of discounts on training opportunities, annual conference. Um, but barring that, the, there's a lot of tremendous and valuable information on our website that will help um, those of you in the, the water uh, industry and then those of you that are just in public sector, public sector finance. So um, my contact information is on the slide. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Again, my name is Eva Olsaker. Uh, my email address is eolsaker at gfoa.org. And my phone number is there. Um, but essentially with that, we're happy to partner today and have Margaret um, provide us with her case study. And so I'll introduce Margaret. And um, again, um, so Margaret Mojia is the executive manager of um, uh, executive manager of finance for the West Basin Municipal Water District, and she has oversight over accounting, treasury, debt management, procurement, and she's currently developing a business outreach program to reach out to local and small businesses. Prior to working for the district, Margaret worked at, at Coopers and Lyburn as a staff associate. She earned her BA in economics from the University of California at Santa Barbara, and she maintains her license as a certified public accountant. Uh, currently, Margaret serves as the past president for the California Society of Municipal Water Districts and is a member of the Career Development Committee. Margaret is a current member of GFOA and was recently elected to the executive board in May, where she'll serve a three-year term. And she's also the co-chair of the Mentorship Committee for the Women in Public Finance. And following Margaret, Chris Dodson, the Associate Director for the Syracuse University Environmental Finance, will close things uh, close things out so with that I'll pass the uh, pass everything over to Margaret or Tesla thank you well good afternoon it's still morning for me but good afternoon to all of you and thank you Tess for bringing up the slides um, so I wanted to uh, share our story of about an asset management case study um, and about how we are trying to improve our financial reporting for water infrastructure facilities. So moving on to the next slide, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the service area that we represent. Um, we are uh, a service area that represents five, uh, five different uh, sort of um, distinct um, service areas. Uh, you can see within the southwest portion of Los Angeles. Uh, we were formed in 1947 and uh, as a sort of uh, to represent this area, but then we joined Metropolitan Water District, our regional provider, to insist, uh, ensure that we have um, good potable water for the uh, communities that we serve. Next slide tells a little bit more about West Basin and how we were trying to diversify our water portfolio um, over the years. Uh, you can see starting in 1947, we were 100% on um, 
uh, taking our water from the groundwater. However, what that was uh, doing is that it was starting to uh, um, have the salt water intrude into our groundwater tables. And that was actually starting to turn our, 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 our lawns and you know, landscape, if you will, um, brown. And so we were looking into sort of what the reasonings were for that. And it, again, saw that there was a salt water intrusion that was happening. So again, as I mentioned, we joined West Basin, joined Metropolitan Water District in 1948. Uh, to provide us this in, um, imported um, water. Now this imported water comes from um, north of the um, Sacramento uh, from the Delta, but it also comes from the Colorado River Aqueduct. And so you can see for a number of years from 1947 to 1990, that is what we did. We just, you know, we're kind of a paper agency and we made sure that we had the water to our, our 17 cities. However, in the late uh, 1980s, uh, we had drought conditions here in Southern California, um, so si significant that our West Basin Board uh, took the step to see how we can drought proof our uh, service area by exploring alternative ways to be able to do that. So certainly one of those ways is to actually just reduce the amount of water that we produce or find um, incentives or our tools, if you will, um, um, you know, um, ultra low flow toilets, uh, high efficiency washing machines and other kind of devices, if you will, to do conservation. But the most significant way that we've been able to figure out how to do that is through the use of recycled water. And this is where the case study will come into play. One more slide, next slide, we'll talk about, again, we're still looking at ways to, for us to diversify our portfolio. And we are looking currently at the ocean water desal to add to that pie. Now, we're not stopping looking at other types of ways to be able to uh, reach out to our community, if you will. We are still looking for customers to be able to uh, increase that, uh, um, that wedge, if you will, with recycled water, but and always uh, working on conservation. So one more slide I wanted to share with you bef um, before I get into a little bit more about the assets is just a little bit about our highlights of, of who West Basin is. So again, West Basin, this is our budget we just adopted for this fiscal year. It is a $224 million um, budget of which, you know, a good portion of it actually is from the water sales from our imported water. Um, that represents of, of our $187 million of expenditures, about 130 million of it. So you can see that's a, still a significant portion that's there. But the next big numbers that really do reflect our recycled water program. That includes both our um, operations as well as our debt service, which are, um, equates to about $60 million of that budget. Um, we want to make sure that when we are putting our budget together, of course, that we're achieving our debt coverage ratio. Um, we are set by our bond documents uh, to, to achieve a certain level. But in order for us to maintain our AA rating, we want to ensure that we are uh, setting our, our parameters a little bit higher so that we can have that low cost of debt that's going out there. So again, as someone who's looking to continue to invest into our, um, into our infrastructure and having the need to go out to get debt, the, the need and the importance of getting that low interest rate is so important. The other things we've been trying to do within our budget is of course to make sure that we're increasing that fixed revenue. Those drought conditions didn't just stop in 1980, we actually continue to see that happen um, uh, year over year, um, we might see where we have great rainfall and then we have um, um, some drought conditions. And so we need to make sure that we have those revenues there available for us to make sure we continue to be able to provide those programming. But in addition to that, we want to make sure we have sufficient funds to pay for R&R projects uh, with PAYGO or pay-as-you-go cash, another way to use it. Um, and so we want to make sure we have enough funding that's there so we really, at this point, um, you know, have about $13 million in this year's budget, 2021, that we can use towards paying for those r, &R projects. But you'll see we have a little bit more of a, um, a significant infrastructure that um, right now we're starting to see where our needs are greater than what we can bring in through cash. And so we need to appropriately plan for that. And that takes to that last bullet point under objectives, which is we want to always make sure that we're planning for the future. You know, when we budget for a year, it isn't about the single year, it's about the multiple years and how we plan for it and how we can affect it. Again, some general facts I mentioned to you that we represent a service area representing 17 cities. 
We serve about 850,000 um, in our population. Um, but what's interesting about us is that our customers are actually um, cities and public utility companies and other public agencies. So we actually only have nine customers. We're a water wholesaler, if you will. Uh, so we sell to the cities and they sell to the public utility companies and then they sell down to the individual customers. So a little bit different than, you know, a typical sort of retail water agency. Um, but nonetheless, we have some similar challenges as, as those serve um, and then different um, challenges as well. Um, and as, as you can see, we are also staffed by uh, 56 individuals. So while we represent a large area and have a large budget, um, we are effectively a small group of individuals who are more like project managers, making sure that we uh, address the, um, uh, the goals and missions of, of West Basin. Next slide, please. So next we will get into um, just a little bit about the history and types of the water. And if I can turn your attention to the next slide, which is gives you a little bit of an overview of West Basin. So this actually is an aerial photo of our facility. Uh, we are located, or this facility is located in El Segundo, which is just south of LAX. And you can see that it's quite expansive. Um, it uh, was built over a number of phases. Um, and what you'll see in some following slides is actually that it's not just here that we have our assets. We actually have them um, throughout our service area. But as I mentioned, we are a well-renowned uh, recycling facility. We get, um, when we were giving tours, we were giving tours to individuals uh, from different countries and different locales, be able to show them what we would do here. And I think that we have, our story is pretty unique. Um, not only did we have um, the uh, recycled water that we're delivering to our irrigation customers, we also saw the need um, to expand it to refineries that are in our service area. A lot of them um, associate near the coastline and so we're able to um, help sort of um, lessen their dependence on imported water, make sure that's available for us to drink and be available to the constituents and businesses. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we had the appropriate um, uh, assets there for them as well. <clears throat> And so in order to do that, we need to, of course, understand their water quality requirements. Um, and those are different. And I wanted just to share a little bit more about those water qualities on the next slide. So as this slide shows, we have five different water quality types that we have, uh, are currently produced um, at that facility. So one is the irrigation water. So again, we have a um, purple pipeline that is throughout our service area. The, um, and that service area, um, like I said, takes this pipeline out to um, schools and medians and parks. Um, it is used at um, anywhere that you can say, do we need to have good drinking water to be used there? No, we can use uh, um, this purple pipe water, if you will. Um, the next ones, the next three, really refer, refer to um, the water that we produce um, uh, for our refineries. Um, our refineries use a lot of water to produce. Um, um, those uh, for their production. And so there's a couple different ways that they do that. One is through a cooling tower um, and the others are through these uh, uh, pr uh, either low pressure or high pressure boiler feed. The difference really just between the low and the high is that the high pressure actually goes through a second um, process of what we refer to as reverse osmosis. And so there's um, significant infrastructure for that to be able to do. do. And the last one, the groundwater replenishment water. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the reason we were formed is because we were actually seeing ourselves deplete our groundwater basin. And as a result of that, um, the salt water was starting to come into our uh, into our, that groundwater table. So what has been done is actually that the uh, county of Los Angeles actually goes through and they have uh, put in over a hundred um, uh, um, uh, wells along the uh, coastline and then they inject water back into it. So again, we were using potable drinking water to be able to uh, inject into that groundwater basin. But we found that with um, the amount of time that the water percolates sort of down in the groundwater basin, we would be able to actually do this very high quality um, recycled water um, and then inject that into the barrier. And so then again, lessen our dependence on imported um, drinking water. Um, and so we are able to provide these different types of waters out of our facilities. So 
So now moving on to the next slide, I wanted just to kind of give you a little bit of, of the kind of the where our facilities are and what they are. Um, and so let me just begin with that. We have a pump station over at the Hyperion treatment plant. Um, and this brings us in a secondary affluent water. Now that Hyperion treatment plant is not our own. It is owned by the city of Los Angeles. Uh, but what that is, is it's actually sewer water that would normally go out to the, uh, um, go to them. They would treat it once, um, make it that secondary fluent water, and then send it out to the um, ocean. So what we've done is we've taken a portion of that water and said we can further treat that water for those five water qualities that I described. So that's a very key and important um, infrastructure for us. Moving on, the ECLWRF, which stands for the Edward C. Little Water Reclamation Facility. Uh, Edward Little would happen to be a former uh, director of ours, and we wanted to um, provide that to him in memory. And what this is, is that facility that you saw in that picture on the previous slide, where um, it is the, our main facility where we do all of the treatment that's there. But some of that treatment actually needs to happen at our satellite facility, and the next two bullets there talk about where those facilities are. So one of them is over in El Segundo, um, then in Torrance. And if we move to the next slide, you'll see that actually, we actually have a refinery um, also in Carson, um, and it's more of a regional facility to help out in, to a different area that's there. Um, the next bullet there, the uh, disinfection station, that happens to be a few disinfection stations that are throughout our service area. And the reason those are in place is depending upon the pipeline and the size of the pipeline, um, we can get the water to them. But if it, the customers are not pulling that water, that water will become a little bit stagnant. And as a result of that, might have an odor associated with it. And so we have those disinfection stations there to be able to mitigate against that odor and still be available for them when they need the water. Also, we have some pump stations within our service area to ensure, again, that to deal with the elevation changes within our service area. Largely, you know, we can say that we're relatively flat, but we do have, you know, some need to be able to deal with some of those elevation changes. And then finally, the last item there is our, our pipeline. What I refer to as our purple pipe uh, is uh, throughout our service area. And if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see a little bit of what that looks like. So you can see that purple pipe throughout our service area, and then you can see some of those locations of those assets that I talked about, or those locations I talked about. Not all of our service area, of course, is, uh, you know, you see that purple pipe, and that's what we continue to strive for each day to see where it's plausible for us to, and feasible for us to uh, make that happen. So I wanted just to now to show you on the next slide, which is a little bit more about our process. And this is, shows you a little bit of sort of the complexity, if you will, of sort of who uh, West Basin is. We get that water from the upper left-hand corner where it says secondary affluent. That's where we get our uh, water, if you will, our raw water to be able to treat. And you can see that go, um, depending upon the type of water that we're trying to produce, you can see that it goes um, into a number of different um, processes. And as a part of that, then of course, then we have a number of assets that need to happen. So that might be that we need um, chemical storage tanks. Uh, we might need microfiltration or reverse osmosis, membrane systems, um, pumps, electrical systems, storage tanks, pipelines, of course, our building to house the staff that works there, um, motors, ultraviolet, biofors, a lot of uh, technical terms that our engineers um, know very well how they work in, into our system, but you can see that you know, the complexity of our system, not only in size and in location, but also in the types of assets we have, um, um, you can see uh, it's a pretty complex system. So if we can turn our attention now to our case study, um, I am happy would be happy to kind of share what West Basin did in order to kind of improve our financial reporting. So going to the next slide, um, let me just share the kind of the overall issue, the process and the results, and then I'll go into each one of them and share about those uh, GFOA best practices that Ava talked about. So <clears throat> I wanna just again, start with our West Basin journey. Um, we had a situation in which we have a very complex system and we wanted to keep it simple. So what did we do? Well, we took that one facility and we made it, um, 
and but it's made up of many components. But when we first put it into our system, we actually put it in as one asset. Um, and so with one year or one uh, useful life. And so that was something that needed to change. And we followed that methodology for a number of years. You saw that we had five phases starting in 1995. It wasn't until 2006, uh, I think the light bulb finally went off and we said, we've got to make a change here. Um, and so many public agencies are also going to be dealing with that legacy issue. You know, you kept it simple at the beginning, but really there's complexity in it. And what can we do to make sure that we have the right information that, at the right time? Um, and so as you're capturing this information, it's, it's important to think about, yes, there might be a little work up front, but it's so important to track and report them um, and figure out what is those useful lives for the, uh, each of those assets. What are we trying to replace so that we can make sure that we can capitalize that new asset that's there? So for us at West Basin, we found the value in hiring professionals, investing in technology, uh, creating policies, um, developing meaningful procedures, and I'm really, I want to emphasize too, collaborating with our, our engineering team and our operations team. Um, we know the numbers, but they know the assets, and it's important that the both of us work together. So let's go on to the first area, which is the issue. So again, I mentioned to you, we had um, um, the initial phase was that we you know, put it into the system in 1995, $200 million. As I mentioned to you, we recorded as one useful or one asset with one useful life. Um, and again, we continued that practice until 2006. Um, however, we got a, uh, an, a comment from our auditors that says, you know, it's really interesting. You keep adding assets, but you're not disposing anything. Very good observation. And we, you know, and we looked at it and said, you know, we could be overstating our financial statements. And so I uh, wanted to see how is it that we can um, address that issue. So I wanted just to touch upon the first uh, best practice here, and I've given you a little high, um, actually go back one slide, please. Um, so that capital asset um, management. So with that, uh, what, that's one of those GFOA's best practices. That best practice um, it gives us an opportunity for public agencies to kind of assess their capital assets um, and focusing on the planning and budgeting for those assets, um, looking at, um, how those assets are being inventoried and how they're, um, you should do the periodic assessment of those, um, those assets by looking at the physical condition. Because while you might have a useful life that's associated there, you can find out if your asset is really meeting that to that need. Um, there are records that might say, hey, you know, we've been doing a lot of maintenance, maybe we should be doing something more there. Um, you also wanna make sure that you have a way to find out what are your critical assets. Um, again, for us, the Hyperion pump station is our critical asset. If that goes down, we've got no source water to be able to do what we need to do. So we want to make sure we take care of that. And then also, ultimately, in the end, is how to fund those assets. So it's so important to make sure that you have a comprehensive um, a view, if you will, um, to capital assets. It's not just about recording it into your books, or it's not about the engineers building what they need to do. It's the collective effort on both sides. Um, so I encourage you to look at that best practice. All right, now moving on to the next slide, please. So the process. The process here, oh, thank you. The process here, and I wanted just to talk about another best practice that, um, that GFOA has, which is the capitalization threshold of capital assets. And while we did have a, um, a capitalization policy at the time that we were putting these assets in in 1995 and through 2006, we really found ourselves in a place where um, maybe we needed to take a better look at our, at our policy. So again, GFOA has another best practice, capitalization threshold for capital assets. And what's nice about that is, is that capital assets, you know, usually it's about the cost associated with it and it's about something that has longer than a useful life of one year. So having an understanding of those assets and how long they are typically in service will help an agency determine what is the best useful life that um, fits for them. Uh, because again, different assets have different useful lives. So I mentioned I have pumps. You know, pumps may only have, you know, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years, but I might have membranes that have five years. And again, when I put them all in at 40, neither one of those met that requirements. And so it was a really important for us to really understand that. Um, it's also important to understand that threshold of the dollar um, and, and what's included in that dollar. 
Um, and so um, we want to make sure that we understand the dollar that's theirs. So in other words, it's about the years, it's about the dollars, that's what we come up with for capitalization. So for West Basin, we worked with our engineering and operations team to understand those assets um, being tracked by their system, their computer maintenance management system, the CMMS system. And that system had a greater level of detail than what we incorporated in our own financials because um, it reflected those um, tiny little assets that we, you know, that were under our threshold. Um, it talked about the maintenance level. It talked about the general condition of those assets. And so we wanted to understand sort of what those assets were. And then we started to compare, if you will, those two assets between the two systems. Uh, this allowed us to um, not only figure out sort of, hey, you know, when we've got this asset here, it's got different useful lives, um, it allowed us to figure out which one also were not no longer in use. So the more that we kind of dug into the details and then we try to see how did it associate to our individual accounting records, we were able to figure out where are the ones that were no longer in use um, so that we can remove them, but also to figure out where we are with the current ones so we understand when they need to be replaced. Because the important thing here, as I mentioned, um, when we heard from our auditors, we were overstating our assets or could potentially be overstating our assets. And so we were putting in new assets to replace existing assets that were in our, in our system, but we were not, um, like I said, removing them. And so we wanted to understand what that dynamic was because the, the point is, is that once they're fully utilized and removed off the system, then you can start to capitalize the new one and we weren't doing that. So we wanted to make sure we corrected that. So um, what we did again was identify those different assets, trying to um, look at what are the components that made up of those individual items. We then calculated that replacement value of those component assets. And I have the formula right there on that screen. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we understand sort of we replaced it, um, but we don't know what the original cost was because it was all in that big one number. So we had to figure out where it was and then we sort of backtrack into what it was. And then what we did is we then had to go into our financial records and reduce the historical value for the original asset that was in there so that we can record these new assets and then dispose of those assets um, into, our, um, uh, into our system. So I want to now share with you our uh, results um, and that results um, that you see um, is um, shown on this page here. But before I get there, I wanted just to touch upon one other best practice that GFOA has, which is the role of the finance director in capital asset management. And I would say not just the finance director, but anyone over on the finance side has a role um, that's there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and the importance of this particular best practice is that, again, it talks about that collaboration of finance and engineers. We know the numbers, they know the assets. We need to work together in order to make sure this happens. Um, this allows us to make sure that we develop those financial policies appropriately. We understand the inventory of them. We understand the evaluation of them. Um, we understand sort of the long-term planning associated with it. So again, back to West Basin's journey, finance um, met with our operations and engineering team to really uh, understand those assets. Uh, understand the condition of those assets and what we were allowed to do, and it was a great um, opportunity, was to actually go with them when they did those condition assessments. So we can understand, well, why is a pump this and why is a, you know, a motor that, or why is a membrane this or a bio for that? We, we were able to really understand the assets more discreetly um, uh, uh, to understand what, you know, what is comprised of that so we can help, help in sort of in the ongoing sort of accounting for them. Um, we also then were able to understand the process that they go through to make sure that we understand where it is um, and the different types of assets that there are so that we can make sure, again, that we're tracking them appropriately. Uh, again, we don't have, you know, 100 assets types so that we have 100 different types of useful lives. There's a general range that we use within each of those items. Now there are general industry standards that you can follow and that's a good guidance that's there and you can even go to your peer agencies and find out what it is. But I would strongly encourage you to be able to go and look at your own history because your own history is going to be, might be slightly different than what your, your next door neighbor might have. But the other thing I also want to emphasize is, is that you could, you know, capitalize whatever you want. You can say $1,000 two years. 
Uh, but the work associated with doing a thousand dollars in two years might be pretty extensive for us it would be um, in fact we right now have three years and ten thousand dollars and um, i will tell you that my engineering staff and my um, finance staff um, one on each side they spent a good part of a month going through those financial records uh, and so we're actually looking at changing that dollar threshold um, to increase it there, because we were looking at, well, wh where do we start to ex uh, capitalize it? Where do we start to expense it? Um, so that we can cut to see what's going on there. <clears throat> uh, then we were able to, um, you know, go through and uh, understand, like I said, that process that's there. And that has really helped us at the year end process. Our engineers understand what we're looking for and we know what to ask for. And that's the important thing too, is understanding what it is that to, to ask for. So what are our results? Our results is that we disposed of 236 um, com, um, asset components um, valued at about $27 million. So that was a significant change that actually uh, created a prior period adjustment for us, but we were able to show sort of a good news story about that. And we've been able to continue to go through um, systematically as things are being replaced to make sure we understand, are they there, you know, if we're replacing something, we got to go find where it is so that we can get it out of our records as well. Um, so finally, um, if I could just take you to, um, um, actually, I'll just give you my final takeaway points here, um, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Chris for his points, which is, um, these are my you know, seven uh, key takeaways, if you will. So I want, so understand your capital asset replacement information um, and working with your operations department um, will really help to make realistic budgets going forward um, in order to be able to provide that information to whoever it is for us as the board of directors maybe it's your city council um, so again understanding the, your capital asset replacement number two is really analyzing the impact of that what capital asset replacement is to your unit cost um, for us we are able to um, and, and need to actually, because of the different types of customers we have and different water qualities that's there, um, we need to understand what the unit cost is to do that. So it's not just about the operation side of it, it's about the capital asset as well. Uh, and so having good, accurate information is very important for us to be able to project out what the rates are and what they could be out into the future. The next takeaway is that we want to make sure that we reconcile our information with our operations. Again, we want to make sure that we're having good information between the two systems and that we are making sure that we're fully or partially disposing of those assets. Sometimes, again, we you know, might be able to um, get rid of a portion of our assets. Again, we want to really understand and work with our engineering team for that purpose. We want to review your capitalization policy and make sure that you can validate what your um, your limits are currently. Does it make sense in, in, regard, uh, in regards to what is your experience that's there? Um, and so again, working uh, closely with the engineering team is very helpful with that. One of the things that we also found along the way is that what we call them and what the engineering's called it um, were uh, different. They're very similar, but they were different. And so getting to a consistent taxonomy um, is so important um, so that when we are talking about something that it's not just a generic word, but really what we're specifically talking about so we can help sort of track that information that's there. And I've mentioned it several times, but I'll reiterate it. Again, working with your um, across the table, if you will, um, with your whoever your teams are. For me, it's my operation and engineering team with my finance team to really make sure we understand the information that is the time that's needed to get that information done. And just keeping that open communication between the two. Um, it's not just about the end of the year when we're trying to do um, capitalization, it's throughout the year, understanding the projects that are happening um, and understanding what is, um, allows us to use that information when we need to do this important work to capitalize. So with that, I thank you for your time and I look forward to any questions at the end and I'll turn it over to Chris at this time. Thanks so much, Margaret. I'm gonna get um, Chris all set up here. In the meantime, um, Chris is the Associate Director of the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. And we wanted to have Chris on just to talk a little bit about the importance of um, how small systems can uh, take better care of their assets and having this big picture example is so great, but maybe there are some other things that you can do to be embracing these best practices in other ways.
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Margaret, and, and thank you, Tess. Um, I just want to let you see me the way, uh, as I present as well, that way um, we can um, <clears throat> go through this together like Margaret did. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about water uh, system partnerships um, and just different ways that local, particularly small water mm -hmm. systems can um, be creative about um, partnering together. So there can be very uh, informal arrangements like um, emergency equipment and staff sharing. Uh, you can imagine that between a village and a town, uh, there's a water main break. Uh, they get together in the middle of the night to help each other out uh, or to more formal arrangements. Uh, and so these arrangements could look like any one of these things, a buying consortium. I think we all know that uh, the per unit cost of things like chemicals and other types of equipment go down when you buy a larger quantity. Um, physical interconnection, uh, this is good um, for a couple of reasons, to have redundancy should there be a failure in, in one part of the utility or the system, um, but also uh, opportunities for pot potential growth and uh, maybe even um, revenue from uh, uh, purchased water. Uh, information sharing, managerial collaboration, uh, regional entities such as uh, um, Margaret's uh, utility, uh, financial collaboration, mutual aid. A lot of uh, states actually have set up, uh, like here in New York, the NIWARN uh, system so that we can provide mutual aid to other utilities in times of emergency. Uh, equipment sharing. <clears throat> Uh, mutual uh, mutual aid emergency assistance, sorry, that's on their place. Uh, and then operational collaborations, sharing operators and, and the like. So motivations for collaboration or what's in it for me. Cost savings, that's one of the biggest drivers for collaboration, for shared services uh, and things like that. Um, addre addressing staffing needs. Uh, the water industry is really facing a, a, a dire, pivotal time where we've got so many folks who are retiring from this industry, really across all sectors, but particularly the water industry. Um, and we need to find ways to replace them. And at the same time, the, our, particularly our smaller utilities are finding that they have budgetary uh, impacts too, especially now with the COVID-19 impacts. And so being able to maybe share staff, uh, share other things or ways that is a motivation for these types of collaboration. Uh, maybe you can do more to comply with regulations when you have more capacity because you're sharing uh, the capacity across utilities, across systems. Um, the ability to access professional services, consultants, others that maybe um, other utilities have uh, stronger relationships with or you can uh, develop an intermunicipal agreement and have a contract uh, with a consulting firm that addresses both communities' needs, uh, increased access to necessary equipment and or supplies. Um, so these are some reasons, uh, some motivators for uh, collaboration, but there's also concerns. Uh, folks never want to give up control. Um, and uh, people identify with their own municipality and the services that they provide uh, and may be uncomfortable with uh, beginning to work with others. Uh, it creates a, a feel for vulnerability, um, lack of knowledge of other systems. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, it's hard to partner with folks when you're not sure and entirely sure of, of what you're getting yourself into, so to speak. Um, Maybe being afraid that you're being forced into one option without knowing all of the options that are out there. Um, and sometimes there's just not the, the, the will, if you will, to, uh, to do the collaboration. So some examples of, of collaborations, a buying consortium. Again, this, uh, uh, this example of, of collaboration as I mentioned earlier, looking at ways to uh, reduce costs by uh, sharing uh, purchase or purchasing. Um, this happens in many communities, not just water systems, but uh, here again in, in 
Um, in Syracuse, New York, Onondaga County actually is the purchasing agent for uh, two or three uh, adjacent counties. Uh, and so everybody, including the city of Syracuse, and so everybody enjoys a reduced cost on the things that they purchase together because they're buying in such quantity. Um, a mutual aid agreement, again, looking at ways to provide help uh, to adjacent or or maybe not even adjacent uh, systems uh, and utilities. Um, and these can be informal agreements. Uh, sometimes there's redundancy between um, between systems in a re at a regional scale, where if there's a failure in one system, uh, there's a system who has a redundant an option to provide uh, uh, a replacement for that failure because there's a built-in redundancy. Emergency interconnections, I mentioned this a little earlier as well, um, looking at um, opportunities for uh, water interconnections, should there be contamination, should there be a water main break or some sort of other failure. That way uh, the level of service can remain consistent um, through that partnership. Uh, and that can go both ways, right? So that interconnectedness between uh, two or multiple utilities uh, really offers uh, that added level of security for all of the utilities that are involved in that interconnection. Uh, the shared operator, again, uh, you know, some people call it the silver tsunami, uh, where we have all these folks retiring in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and it makes sense, right? A lot of the water and wastewater utilities are, um, a lot of the smaller ones are a result of, of the funding, the federal funding that was available in the 70s and 80s due to the Clean Water Act and other, uh, other such kind of um, uh, desires to uh, provide this kind of service uh, to communities. Um, there is an econo economic development aspect to that as well. Uh, so anyway, we've got these folks who've been working in these utilities for 20, 30, 40 years, sometimes since the utility, the, the physical infrastructure was built and they're retiring and the, the value of the knowledge that they have most often only in their head <laughs> about those utilities, about this, the service that they provide is something that you don't necessarily want to lose. And so, um, being able to look at retirements, not only within your own community, your own utility, uh, but adjacent utilities and looking at ways to um, provide cost savings by not being forced to hire necessarily a new operator to replace a, a soon to be retired operator, um, but to share maybe looking at creating a succession plan across multiple systems that can allow you to uh, share staff time um, and prevent uh, that, that loss of institutional knowledge as folks retire, and also to start to build in the newer, uh, younger workforce that can potentially serve uh, two or, or more uh, systems. Uh, many communities are, are already doing this, and it's not out of um, out of trying to save money or be proactive, it's out of a, a desperate need because they have a hard time attracting uh, new operators to their to their communities. Shared management again, <clears throat> uh, you could look at uh, the folks who manage your utility, um, members of the GFOA, uh, financial folks, uh, billing clerks, um, legal. Uh, commissioners, others, where maybe you can create uh, efficiencies by sharing the management, um, uh, sharing the management responsibility across multiple uh, districts or utilities. And finally, and people sometimes really hate to even talk about uh, this, but a merger, merger, it might make sense to combine uh, a utility under one either re regional or districts under one regional district or combine different municipal utilities together to provide the same level of service, maybe at a, at a, at a cheaper cost uh, and maybe with greater efficiency. And those are benefits to doing these kinds of uh, share uh, uh, collaborations. So I wanna go through these case studies really quickly. I've only got a couple and then we'll have time for questions for uh, for Margaret and myself. So there's uh, in, in Central Texas, a regional entity for, for new water supply. So several systems had problems meeting their regulatory requirements. Uh, they 
we're really looking for a new water source that could potentially solve that problem. So they formed a regional entity just to secure the new water supply. Um, one member of each of the participating water systems was on the board of the new entity, um, and but but yet all those individual water systems remain. So not one, not any one of those utilities had the capacity to begin to develop a new water source, but together uh, they could create that new entity that did have the capacity to do that for them. Uh, shared operators and managers for rural water systems. I mentioned this uh, a little bit before. Some systems wanted to be bought because it was too hard for them to manage the utility on their own anymore. Um, each system was financed separately. Uh, there's again an, an efficiency there of scale if they were all financed, uh, worked together. Um, operators were on a regional basis already. Uh, they each knew the other systems um, and they had three different levels of, of operators. Shared bookkeeping. Um, again, this is a place, uh, uh, several small systems in New Mexico. They use the same accounting firm. Uh, no connection, no physical connection between the systems other than using the same firm. And they save a lot of money by having that end receive higher level expertise by sharing, um, sharing those bookkeeping services. And the buying consortium, I talked a little bit about this already. Um, working together to negotiate agreements for cheaper prices on, on products. And then um, talking, just one of the, in my earlier slide, I mentioned uh, shared information as being uh, collaboration. And so just talking, um, systems started talking monthly um, and they had invited guest speakers with mutual interest. Um, it ended up leading to a mutual aid agreement uh, and interconnections and cooperation on, on other things as well. So sometimes just getting to know each other, um, securing that level of trust between different utilities and different partners leads to some of these more um, complicated, perhaps, and physical um, collaboration and, and connections. And finally, a utility that started as a municipality and became a regional authority. Again, um, efficiencies of scale here. So these are a few examples. This is my contact information. We've got about seven minutes left for questions. Um, Tess, I don't know if you're in a position to go through some of those questions. I noticed a few for Margaret before I started speaking. And I'd like to thank everybody for participating with us today. Yes, we definitely have a couple questions. And Margaret, if you'd, um, great. Uh, so first, just to, uh, for some last minute housekeeping, um, Yes, the slides are gonna be available. Margaret's is actually already uploaded into the handouts as long as several of those GFOA best practices, but everyone will be receiving a link to the recording of this webinar as well as all the materials. Um, and then moving more into the substantive questions, uh, the first question for you, Margaret, is um, for your water recycling, have you investigated or are you currently recycling wastewater effluent streams from municipal wastewater treatment plants? Um, I think the, the key point there was waste, uh, wastewater treatment plants. Again, we um, our source water is coming from the city of Los Angeles, their Hyperion pump station. So they're already uh, taking some of that water that's there um, and that's the, the source of our water. We are not looking um, to go to other sort of uh, wastewater to be able to do that. We're not a wastewater um, uh, organization, but we use wastewater to do what we need to do with um, the recycled water. I hope that answers the question. Definitely. And then the next question, and I think you have covered this, but you talked about all the types of water that you do produce. Do you produce any potable water? No, we do not. Uh, actually, let me step back. Actually, we do have a brewer, um, our, our Brockish DeSalter, um, in what, another city, uh, city of Torrance. Um, and we uh, started that off as a pilot plant, actually, um, back in 1993, and it was only supposed to be active for five years. Uh, we actually are up with it right now. It's had a sort of a, a storied past. It's been up, it's been down. Um, it's not our primary focus, but uh, we were um, asked to be a part of that project, uh, like I said, back in the 90s. Um, and it does give us some opportunity to do that, and it sells it to um, one customer to be able to do it. But um, our primary focus 
right now is um, in the production of, of water is through recycled and um, and eventually with the uh, ocean water desal, if that is, you know, goes through the in, um, entire process. We are um, have just gone through the EIR phase, uh, the environmental impact report phase, um, but we're still sort of in that uh, um, in that uh, process at this moment. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then the next question, this is a little bit long, but I think it's real, well worth asking it as written. How does project cost accounting tie into your asset management program? For example, with a water line replacement project, you have a new asset when the project is complete. Do you maintain a separate cost accounting system to determine what to capitalize when the project is complete? And would this include the labor costs involved to complete the project? So it's a great question. Um, we have um, in our financial system, we do do it by activity. So um, as projects are happening, we do track it by um, location, by customer, by type of asset. Um, well, depending upon the asset, it might be a little bit more um, granular or not. Um, and so we use that information. Um, I would say that it's heavily still manually driven um, because um, of the way we sort of capture costs and how they come about. So there are the direct costs that we get from, you know, the construction company, from the consultant, you know, to, to build whatever we need to build. Uh, but we do also include costs for uh, those pro uh, engineers, those project managers I referred to, uh, to also include into them. Um, and so what's included right now is just their direct labor as well as their uh, associated benefits. So if they spend, you know, 10% of their time on a project, 10% of it will be allocated to that particular project. Great. And then next, um, do you get operators involved with the accountants in determining annual depreciation? Do they provide feedback on expected useful life of assets? You know, that's a, a, another great question. Um, uh, what's interesting about our agency, again, I mentioned that we only have 56 employees. So that treatment facility that I shared with you um, and our distribution line, we actually use uh, two contracts in order to manage that information. Having said that though, we um, have a good relationship with each of those contract operators to um, provide us guidance. Um, but where we're getting our guidance from is through our, our, our engineers, our op operations staff that work very closely with those uh, contract operators to understand where it is. Uh, we get information from them and we interpret and analyze that information uh, from the engineering and operations side. And then they work with us in finance to make sure that we are um, capturing the right information. Fantastic. Um, so I, there is a question about funding. So Margaret, maybe you can take a stab and then Chris, if you could add anything that you can think of. This question is about, do you have any recommendations of grants for special districts or utilities undergoing um, capital asset assessments? So um, I will just say that, you know, we have been fortunate to get some grants. Um, um, uh, we've had some um, local grants, if you will. So our, our regional provider, Metropolitan Water District, did provide us an incentive, if you will, for every acre feet that we had. Um, a big portion of that agreement just unfortunately uh, ended this uh, past year. So we uh, are looking for alternative sources, of course. Um, but uh, we've also been successful through the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to get funding to be able to support um, our capital infrastructure. Um, and uh, so those are a couple of things. Uh, we also did to get one actually um, when it came to an energy related one. We actually got one through uh, for us as our local uh, Southern California Edison um, was able to provide us some funding there. So they do come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, and, um, and, and, and then what we have uh, fortunate to us is, you know, a lot of ears and eyes out there uh, listening. We work with our lobbyists um, well, the, at the federal and state level as well as our individuals um, and staff that actually um, try to um, hear what's going on as well, um, you know, on the lo more local level. Awesome. Chris, can you think of any quickly? Uh, it, you know, it depends on the, the states, it's the state by state and also the size of the utility. Um, there are uh, generally uh, what, what I'd call engineering planning grant kind of um, opportunities out there for folks who are looking at developing an asset management plan or doing assessments to see what more um, implementation type projects they may need to go um, from there. 
Fantastic. Well, we are right at the top of the hour, and I hate to say we did not make it through all the questions, so I will make sure that we, we have a record of them, and we'll do our best to get in touch with you to finish up answering these fantastic questions. But please take a look. Uh, I did put a link to our survey in the chat, so go ahead and take our survey if you'd like to give us some feedback, and I'd love to turn it back to Chris and Margaret for their closing comments. We didn't say who was going first. So I'll go first, Chris, and turn it over to you afterwards. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about, again, West Basin's journey. Um, you know, it, we've certainly are still on that pathway to make sure that we're improving our financial reporting. My contact information is on the uh, uh, last slide of my uh, handout. So if you want to reach out to me and uh, ask some of those questions, I'm happy to, to participate. And uh, again, uh, I also will just say, look at those GFOA uh, resources uh, through their best practices, their publications. Um, they do do a, a wonderful job of um, providing great resources to us um, so that we can use that in the day-to-day -day job that we have. I'd just like to thank everyone for participating and um, thank Margaret for her time and Eva for being a great partner, Eva and GFOA for being a great partner to the Environmental Finance Center Network as we deliver um, training and technical assistance programs such as this webinar. And we're always available to help, even if you have a quick question, like many of the ones in the question box that we weren't able to answer today, um, even to more uh, in-depth um, uh, assistance on, on your water and wastewater infrastructure needs. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Margaret and Eva. Thank you, Tess. Thank and you. Good Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all.